President Bola Tinubu has officially signed the student loan bill into law. The bill's enactment comes after the repeal and reenactment of the Student Loans Act of 2023, following a campaign promise by President Tinubu. Initial delays led to a missed start date in January 2024. In a recent letter addressed to the Senate in March, President Tinubu emphasized the urgent need to pay attention to the bill, highlighting its importance in addressing educational access and opportunity in Nigeria. During a brief signing ceremony at the presidential office at the Aso Rock Villa, President Tinubu reiterated the vital role of education in poverty alleviation and reaffirmed the government's commitment to ensuring that every citizen has access to quality education and opportunities for skills development. I've just signed a bill proclaiming the student loan effectively. First of all, I must thank the members of the National Assembly for their expeditious handling of this bill considering the children of Nigeria, that education is the tool to fight against poverty effectively. We are determined to ensure education is given the proper attention necessary or the country, including skill development programs. This is to ensure that no one, no matter how poor their background is, is excluded from quality education and opportunity to build their future. We are here because we are all educated and we are helped. In the past, you've seen a lot of our children drop out of colleges and given up the opportunity. There is no more. The standard and the control is there for you to apply, no matter who you are as long as you are a Nigerian citizen. This is a very good day, very great, great day for the country, great day for education, great day for Nigerian students and uh, who have great need you know, for support. And we want to thank Mr. President for his compassion and his passion for the, the downtrodden actually who are the beneficiaries of this scheme. Now the days when students will be struggling to sponsor themselves uh, in their various educational endeavors is over, both at the tertiary and those who are seeking skills, who are seeking to be skilled, to be empowered, you know, to move on in, with their lives. So it's a very great day for the country. This is commendable as for Nigeria students that I represent, we are happy. Uh, we'll see Mr. President's commitment to the development of education. And today, the entire education system is happy. The Nigeria students particularly are happy. Our parents are happy that, yes, in Nigeria, even the children of the poor can have access to quality education. We see Mr. President's commitment and the signing of the bill today. It shows that uh, Mr. President is a father of modern education in Nigeria. And the initiator of this bill is a hero of education. So we are happy. Well, a representative of the student says he's happy and um, we see an inclusion. Mm. In the last, um, for the last um, fund, there were complaints about the fact that students weren't represented on the board. Rufai, your take on this story? I mean, so a, a lot of rejig has gone through it. I mean, pretty much this is supposed to be all inclusive. So there are no parental thresholds as regards uh, what is going to be on the bill. But every, anyway, there are still, you know, repayment quotas out there. First two years after NYC. Uh, the fact that, okay, guarantors uh, list to, you know, was put in there initially, but I think that that's been tinkered with, that's been scrapped now. 
So you also have a lot of quotas in there, you know, that pretty much makes it easier for you to be able to access. You still need some form of identification and all of that. Uh, as regards as, as regards some bottlenecks, how it's going to be run effectively, you know, uh, there's been some clarification as regards how the process is going to be run. But my stance on this student, you know, loan thing has always been, it's just going to create another debt cycle in the economy, money that cannot be accounted for. Even in better climes, when you have better economic prospects, the student loan challenge is the problem. I think it was Joe Biden in America that's been trying as much as possible to be able to cancel a lot of the student loans because students can definitely not pay them. And these interest rates keep piling up and this debt with a lot of interest. If my memory serves me right, I think Barack Obama just cleared his couple of years before he became president. What I will favor, what ASO has been favoring the argument is continue with a system where the tuition fee is highly subsidized. Because if you are saying, okay, you want university autonomy, you want them to be able to charge effectively and all of that, how can you then charge appropriately? There are many schemes to be able to make the university system work. In other parts of the world, there's a, a great deal for endowment. You know, you can use endowment model and all of that. They said this is also going to be funded by some level of endowment. But have it in such a way that the tuition works for people, highly subsidized, then they can go through the wrong rather than in making them incur debts. Also, I hear that people that uh, have businesses, it's going to be 10 percentile of their profits and all of that. I mean, how can you even adequately assess their profits? So there are many bottlenecks, but the truth is the law is a working document. When we start to see it, we'll, we'll see how apt is it. And also hope we're not going to have the shenanigan of it's man, no man. It's based on party affiliation that we can process your documents. Is there going to be an independent system? You know, to be able to th check through this malaise and all of that in our system because we know how it goes. Largely, if the government says it's the way to go, kudos to them on it, but I don't support the student loan scheme and I have my doubts about it. Okay, okay two things. <clears throat> and I will try to break it down as much as possible. Yesterday, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu signed the uh, Repeal and Amendment Act of the Access to Higher Education Act of Nigeria, which was a bill that uh, the executive had initially introduced. The executive saw that there were issues with the bill. They sent it back to the National Assembly on March 14, and they got expeditious uh, correction of that bill. Um, well, that bill, after it was passed in June 2023, and it became the law, the Access to uh, Higher Education Act. There were attempts, several attempts, to launch it, to inaugurate the students' uh, loan scheme. They tried in uh, November 2023, it didn't work. They moved it to uh, January, it didn't work. They moved it to February, it, it didn't happen. They told us in March, that, uh, oh, it will be uh, launched uh, and properly inaugurated. But what we then ha uh, had from the Nigerian Education Loan Fund was that, oh, there were issues with the law. So on March 14, 2024, the executive sent that bill back to the uh, National Assembly for reconsideration. And that bill was uh, passed, uh, reviewed expeditiously. The argument is that the students' loans bill had been, uh, the loan sacked, had been delayed because government discovered on the basis of reactions to the original act that was uh, passed in 2023, reactions about some of the provisions. Now, the true test of any law is in its implementation. When you do a law, the law is supposed to serve the people. When the law does not serve the people, it becomes an ass, as uh, Mr. Bumblebee uh, say, tells us in Charles Dickens' City of Two Cities. So law, you know, law is organic, it's evolving, it's a living entity. So what we have seen here is a demonstration of it. You do a law, you look at it, as you try to implement it, it does not work, you go back to the drawing table. That, in my view, for the Tinubu administration, is perfect. Now, what is it that they, they looked at? In the bill that became an act uh, in 2023, there were certain provisions. Some of these provisions have to do with governance. 
the chairman of the CBN was made uh, uh, the uh, chairman of the board. The governor of the CBN was made chairman of the board. There was, but there was no proper delineation in terms of day-to-day -day management. That old act created uh, the Nigerian Education Loan Fund, uh, the uh, NELF. Uh, but that NELF, you know, its responsibilities were vague because it, it was not really a legal entity in that old act. Not being a legal entity means it cannot enter into contracts, it, can, it could not even enter into loan agreements. Another omission in the old bill was that, was the uh, threshold, you know, in terms of the, the, the threshold uh, for uh, loan applications. Now, what that said was that your parents, you must come from a family that did not earn, that, that earned just about 500,000 per month, uh, per, annum. per annum. Now, what it meant was that children who came from families whose parents earned 45,000 naira per month would not qualify under the old law, now the old law. So that raised issues about equity. It, that old law also said that if your parents had ever defaulted in terms of loan payment, if your father or mother had ever taken a loan and did not pay back, you will not qualify. That uh, old law also said that, look, the loan was restricted to tuition fees. Now, students of federal tertiary institutions do not pay tuition fees. I recall at the University of Lagos, some of my lecturers complaining, you people don't pay tuition fees. You just want to collect a, a master's degree free of charge. Okay, we, we, we have tried our best. But that was an issue. Federal university, universities do not, you know, uh, pay tuition fees. And that was a restriction. So the, the original law that was passed in 2023 did not cover other expenses, you know, that students uh, could enjoy. And then, of course, uh, that uh, old law also says something that if you were a beneficiary of the loan, and you left NYSC two years. Two years after, you must pay, whether you have a job or you don't have a job. OK? So those were the issues about eligibility and then method of application. It was also said in the old law that you had to apply manually at an age when everybody is talking about BVN and IN. So that was uh, an omission. And then in the uh, old law, if you, pay, if you fail to pay, you go to jail. And they will have asked you for their money two years after, after your NYC. So it was, uh, it was a cumbersome law. So what they have now done is to take a look at those omissions in the original law and to try to update it and to show that the Nigerian Education Loan Fund uh, telling us we will uh, launch the uh, student's loan uh, scheme uh, tomorrow. We will launch it uh, this thing. They gave us an explanation that the reason they could not do it was because of these omissions. So the, the right thing to do, and I think the Tinubu administration has done the right thing in this regard, by going back to the National Assembly. And I think that the National Assembly has also done the right thing by correcting all of these omissions that they identified and that I have outlined on this program. Now, what they have now done is that in the new law, the Repeal and Reenactment Act on Access to uh, Higher Education now says, look, if, uh, if uh, your father does not earn up to 50,000 per month, you are qualified. If your father in uh, 19, uh, as Yorubas would say, uh, oh, the, uh, a loan, uh, you, you, uh, you are still qualified. Uh, the new law is saying, look, it's not just about tuition. Even when 
You know, there are departmental fees. They ask you to pay departmental fees, identity card fees, all kinds of fees in, in the university. Okay, so you can also apply for that. And now the new law says, in terms of repayment, that, look, if, uh, if uh, you don't get a job, you don't have to pay. You pay only when you get a job. In a country where unemployment is on such a high scale, I think that uh, makes sense. So this is the government responding to reality and linking the law to social reality. And that's why I think it's, it's a good achievement, what they have done. Now, this uh, new law also says that uh, you, your loans can be forgiven. If you never get a job or you die in the process, your loans can be uh, forgiven. You can be rich enough. So, but in the, old, in the other one, in fact, they were planning to even collect loans, student loans from you, from the grave. So these are some of the uh, new developments. Then they now ha they have restructured the governance process in the new law. They have also, you know, uh, reviewed eligibility. You know, they have, uh, 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 well, the only thing is that if you give false statement, if you make false claims, that's a felony. That's a crime. So people must know that even with all these new advancements in the refinement of the law, if you go and lie about your circumstances, you are guilty of a felony and you can go to jail. Yeah. However, to return finally to the ideological underpinning of the entire thing, uh, President Tinubu was saying, oh, uh, he's committed to education. Education should be a priority. It should be a way out for poor people in Nigeria. Well, what he was expressing was an ideological principle that is not necessarily original, but that is uh, Awoistic. In uh, 1955, Chief Obafemi Awolowo, then Premier of the Western Region, introduced this universal free primary education. It's the same philosophy advanced at the time by Chief uh, Eso Awokoya, who was Minister of Education in the Western Region, and uh, Professor Sonya Onobamiro, who was also involved in drafting the policy, because we're talking about policy. That is what uh, President Tinumbu is reinventing. Education as a major tool for national development, for national reinvention, for national regeneration. And in that regard, it's on the right track again, I say. Now, look at Nigeria today. In fact, I argued the other day at a colloquium in honor of Pastor Itwa Igudalo that education has to be the main thing going forward. Nigerian children, if you don't educate them, at a time when they are talking about artificial intelligence, you know, Germany, all those developed countries, they are training their children. We are here producing children who are sleeping at uh, betting uh, games uh, outfits, you are, who are joining Boko Haram, who are killing uh, soldiers with incantations in Okwama. The larger majority, that is. There is a significant majority that is doing well in fintech, in agriculture, and all of that. So President Tinubu returning to that original idea that to build a nation, you must educate your children. I think I commend him in that regard. Well, I don't think I commend him in that regard because it's yeah, very obvious. Because for him to say that every child must have access to education, with over 13 million children in northern Nigeria not having access to education, uh, uh, President Tinubu is on the right track in that regard. However, the taste of the pudding is in the eating. It is when they implement the law and it works that we will be able to sit here and say Tinubu is doing well. So they, 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 they've done well in terms of the framework, but how would they implement it? The government says they have provided over 200 billion naira in the 2024 budget. Okay, let's see how they spend it. Okay, beyond that, uh, one character who is the president of NANS, I think he also put his own mouth into the matter. He said, oh, this shows that uh, Tinumbu is the father of modern education in Nigeria. 
No, it is too early to say Tinubu is the father of modern education. Awolowo's example was on the basis of the evidence that we saw. When Western Nigeria declared free education in 1955, in 1958, the people of the Southeast also launched a campaign for education as a major priority. See what the Igbos have done with education. They have the largest number of PhDs in Nigeria. In 1959, the uh, Northerners, they had their own first meeting on education because education became competition. But the Northerners uh, didn't understand the same way the South Easterners, who were a bit uh, you know, frustrated by the Civil War and taken back, but they've advanced further. So look, education is, is it. So President Tinubu has identified a major issue for the 21st century. But he's not a hero yet. The Nance president doesn't know what he's talking about, all these small boys. We will call him a hero when we see the results. Absolutely. That's my point. The result, as we've mentioned a number of times, the taste of the pudding is in the eating. I'll just touch on two points from the um, reenacted, repealed and reenacted um, Higher Education Act, now signed into law by President um, Bola Ahmed Tinubu. The first thing uh, we talked about, you touched on, was in the administration. So in the documents, we haven't seen the actual act in terms of the final documents, but from um, re revelations or details of what's come out from is the first thing is that with regards to the management of NEL funds, that's the Nigerian Education um, Loan Fund, in this, new, in this new act, there's a provision for an administration team beyond the board. So the board has been delineated or separated from that of the CBN governor because according to reports, and as it ought to be, the CBN should face, um, you know, the CBN governor should face the remits of his job. And so it's separate. Now in doing this, they are now going to be a management team that would manage the day-to-day -day running of the fund. What this means is that the fund provisions, that's the money that's going to be accrued to the fund, will also pay for these administrative costs. Now, one of the things that happens a lot of times with funds and um, you know, not-for-profit organizations is that sometimes a huge chunk of the budget goes to administration. And this happens in many parts of the world, not just in Nigeria. So this isn't clear as to what percentage of the fund will go to the actual running of the fund and to the actual disbursement of funds. Because already there were conversations around the fact that the amount of money um, budgeted wasn't quite enough, and now it's going to be depleted further by paying for the day-to-day -day running. And there are mentions around a managing director, executive directors, and of course other officers on ground. Now we know how these things sometimes work out. So it would be great to have a clear idea of how much money would go into running the fund and how much money will go into actual disbursement to the most vulnerable and most in need. That's one. The second aspect of this is the repayment structure. So it said that two years post NYSC, However, there's no provision as to the level of employment you have to have. In other parts of the world where the um, loan, loans like this work, there must be an employment or an earning threshold to ensure that the individual is able to pay. Also, perhaps there might be an aggregated structure of repayment. So for, for instance, someone who is earning 100,000 Naira might be expected to pay less in repayment than someone who is earning, for instance, 500,000 Naira. Also, this brings a bigger conversation around the fact that there are other variables that must be put in place to ensure that this repayment works. For instance, we have to solve the unemployment challenges. If we don't, then we're going, just going to be churning out university graduates who have a burden of loans, and that's what you talked about, a burden of loans, who are unable to pay back because either one, they're un underemployed, it means that the money they're earning in terms of salary is nowhere near enough for living um, costs and then to pay back a loan, or the fact that there are no jobs at all. This means that we'll keep on having a number of defaults, a number of people who are unable to pay the loan, and it defeats the spirit of the loan. So whilst we're saying Sending our children to university, it's also important that we're also making provisions for what happens post-university and ensure that there are jobs enough for them to, there's a job market for them to enter into and earn well enough to repay loans. There's a provision for an act of God as well in case you're, on, and, and that's a, a, a term or a provision for forgiveness. So beyond death and, um, you know, unemployment is also an act of God. So for instance, if you are, um, you come into, you are disabled or un, unable to pay because of an accident or something, that can be considered in terms of unforgiveness. Now, in terms of the fraudulent activities, is if you declare 
um, in, 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 a, in a false sense that you don't have a job when you do have a job or have a business that you're running and put that as an, op an option for not being able to repay the loans then becomes a criminal action and you can't get up to three years in jail. So these are some of the highlights of this, um, this new bill. I, it's definitely better than the old. As Dr. Bati has elaborated, it addressed some of the key concerns from the old act. But there are still a few things that need to be tweaked and maybe a few areas that need to be defined and made clear. But all in all, very good. It looks like the students seem to be excited about it. But again, to make this work, other variables or other aspects must be looked into to ensure that it's a huge success. Well, in other news this morning, the federal government of Nigeria yesterday increased the rate paid per kilowatt hour of electricity from about 68 naira to 225 naira for Band A customers who consistently enjoyed 20 hours of supply daily. On the foreign scene in Gaza, World Central Kitchen aid workers founder Jose Andre has accused Israel of targeting his workers systematically, car by car, in his words. But Nir Bakat, a member of Israel's cabinet, slammed Mr. Andre's comments as nonsense, saying the strike was a grave mistake and Israel will carry out investigations. Moving on to the United States of America, where President Joe Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu will be speaking over the phone today. This will mark the two leaders' first phone call since an Israeli airstrike killed seven World Central kitchen aid workers in Gaza.